Good afternoon. <laughs> simple terms, we're just talking about, in a sense, two realities. The reality which is um, completely boundless and free and everything and nothing. The everything and the nothing reality, <laughs> which is a mystery. But within that, what arises is, it, is another little reality called the separate reality in which um, the individually apparent there's an apparent experience after birth of individuality. Um, Self-awareness arises in the tiny child and, and it's like a feeling of an energy that is completely boundless and free after birth and then suddenly there's a feeling of contraction in the body. And uh, there's a sudden um, awareness of, uh, of there being something, a centre, the body. And as the child goes, that, that center of energy becomes for the child its identity. I am a person. So it enters what I call something called the I am dream. I am a real person and I am in a real story and the world is real and what happens in the world to me is real. But there's this feeling as though there are two things, there's me and what happens to me, or what I experience. So there's me and what I experience, and, those two, and there's a sense in that of a se sense of separation. I experience the tree, the tree is over there, and I, I'm here, and so there's a sense of separation. And that sense of separation brings um, a sense of dissatisfaction, as though there's something missing. It doesn't feel whole. For most people, that isn't even acknowledged. They live with it in that way, and that seems to be normal, so they accept it. But for some people, feel more deeply that that sense of something missing, that sense of something not fulfilling, needs to be resolved. But of course, by now, they've grown up in a world of dualism. Because me, self, the eye is dualism. It doesn't enter some dark, funny cloud called dualism. It actually is dualism. So it sees everything in a dualistic way. Experience, the experience of life is dualistic. So when it thinks it would like to become fulfilled, because it's living in a subject-object world, it turns the idea of self-fulfillment into an object that it can obtain. And then it tries to learn how to become self-fulfilled. And of course there are an abundance of teachers and religions and all sorts of things out, organisations out there offering a process which will help people or promises to help people to become self-fulfilled through some sort of process. And of course it's based, all those teachings are based on the idea of change. Well, there's, there's something wrong, you feel something's missing. So what you need to do is to become more aware, more still, more loving, more Christian, more Buddhist, more anything you like. There's lots of mores you can become. And uh, of course, the whole of that activity is, comes out of a dualistic experience. So it comes out of, dualist, of a dualistic experience. Through, and is and is resolved through an act, an action that the individual believes they can take through their own free will and choice in order to find fulfilment. And what we're what we're discussing here was what what being illuminated here is the the awful possibility that not only is it utterly futile to look for something called self fulfilment. But also the whole construct 
I mean, the majority is completely illusory. So that's what we're sharing together. And we can talk about using words together and concepts about the beliefs that the me has about itself, the beliefs it has about the world. And it's possible that some of those ideas and beliefs can unravel through just talking about them. But there's something else that goes on when people are gathered together and there's a readiness or an openness to for there to be something that is absolutely beyond seeking. Then energetically that whole contracted sense of individuality can melt into the whole, apparently. The only thing about all of that is it's discovered when the me has collapsed and there is no more a sense of separation. It's discovered that actually there never was any separation and there never was such a thing as a separate individual. Tony, um, could you say something about, um, well, I've heard people say uh, the first thought was a me thought. Sorry? The first thought was a me thought. Well, it's possible. I don't, I've never thought about it. <laughs> but, but obviously the impact of uh, a contracted energy brings with it a sense of a centre and what can come out of that is the idea of calling that centre me. It so, seems to me, yeah, sorry. So the me, the self or the I can be a thought thereafter. I am or me is or the self is can be um, confirmed by a thought. But a thought really is only um, an understanding of something. It doesn't have any you know, a lot of people put a lot of energy into the idea that thoughts influence everything. They only influence a life if there is a me that takes delivery of the thought. When, when the thought, thoughts are nothing thinking. So the source of everything is nothing. So the thoughts come out of nothing. They arise in the, in the mind, in the head. And then if there's a me there, the me takes delivery of them and gives them great importance because the me thinks it's really important. And it thinks that its life has meaning and purpose. So a thought can reinforce that sense. But I don't think it's the, well, I know it's not for me the initiation of separation. The initiation of separation is a contracted energy. All of this is about energy. It's not about understanding something or reaching another or better understanding. So the energy of contraction brings a sense in the body which is then interpreted as an individuality. Yes, and then arises the question, um, why does nature invent such a thing? No, it didn't. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, nothing invented anything. Uh, there is only nothing, and out of nothing arises this appearance. And it takes every form possible including the form of individuality. 
It's just something that happens and it doesn't happen for any reason. The whole of this, this, um, this nothing and everything is completely meaningless and without purpose. So there isn't something in the heavens that suddenly decides, or oh, let's create a me, and, and because that would be a challenge in a week. It's just what happens. Everything is completely and utterly impersonal and without any aim or purpose of any kind. Except in the dream of me, in the dream of me, of course, the me, the self, has purpose and intention. Because it believes it's on the path. But animals don't have this, is it? No, nothing has. The only thing that feels separate is the human being. And it's a lot to do with the sophistication of the brain. So, uh, and it's been discovered more recently and established that the brain of the individual or the human brain is more sophisticated than the brain of an animal. Well, after and about a year after birth, it reaches a sophistication sufficient enough to abstract a sense of having a separate I or me. That can happen and invariably does because the brain um, uh, creates or a sense of a me in order that the me can be a compatriot in manipulating and dominating the world that we live in. And that's what you're watching now is the apparent me, of course there is that me, but the energy of me attempting to manipulate the world. So it's actually not a grown-up mind, is it? Well, there is no such thing. For me, there's no such thing as a mind. I don't understand what the mind is. What, what is a mind? What is a mind? Let's say uh, the it's, brain. It's not. A, it's not a brain that has uh, a program that's good enough to pass through the me as a mistake. There isn't anything that's good enough to do anything, and there isn't anything right or wrong with anything. Mm -hmm. There's only what happens, including the apparent arising of a sense of me. There isn't, there isn't, you know, in the, in the, in the whole, there isn't, there aren't two. There's not a good or a better and a worse or a good and a bad. It just is what is and is not. That's all there is. But in the world of me, in the world of, of separation, there are better and worse, good and bad, in and out. But all of that is completely and utterly, wonderfully illusory. Well, can I just follow up on the neurological side of this? Um, it seems like the brain has a development. Yeah. And uh, the development of a me is part of it. Yeah, a pattern. A program in the brain. Yeah. That is not sufficient enough to uh, surpass itself, somehow not good enough uh, to become a universal. Brain or well, well, no, because it's because it's dualistic. The, the creation, the brain's creation of an artificial me or, or a, an energy of me is a pure dualism. So it, it's it's obviously completely limited by its dualism. So it lives, it, it, it lives, or it experiences the world as two, a split, which is artificial. So it can never reach anything other. And, and it's ultimate dualism, and that's what you see in the world. What you see in the world is me responding to what it experiences as a polarized world, and there isn't such a thing. Okay, it's an illusion. But it still is a product of a sophisticated brain uh, in comparison to that of a nano. Yeah, but it's still, what doesn't matter how sophisticated the brain of the human is, it nevertheless uh, comes out of and lives in dualism. Don't forget the brain is only a, a, a function in the story, in the apparent story. The fact that the brain is something, is an organism that functions in the story. When the story begins, so the brain begins to function and respond to the, what it sees as an apparent story. When the brain dies, it's the end of the function of the brain because this, the apparent story has ended. And this was the answer that I expected. <laughs> well, that's disappointing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I must have given that one because I don't usually give expected answers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
brain functions in a dualistic dream. The story. There is no story. There's only an apparent story, and the story that appears is dualistic. It's a dream. This uh, um, word you used, contracted energy, does it mean that this energy, because you, this word suggests to me contracted, that is something that I could feel? Yeah, but I'm not, yeah? it's a limited feeling. Yeah. It's a feeling, the me experiences, although it may not acknowledge it, but the me lives in a lot of tension most of the time, because it's in a, in a state of limitation within a, within a boundless energy. And, and that feels threatening for it. So it lives in, as I say, a dualistic story, which seems to be threatening, not entirely, but obviously. And so it lives, limits in that prison. That's why the word liberation, in a sense, is quite a good word, because it's the liberation from the imprisonment of being limited in a dualistic reality. So it's something which I can feel. It can be felt, yeah. Some people feel it, other people don't necessarily. But it's there, and it creates a tension, tension, yeah. and also a dissatisfaction. Most, well, everybody who's in that lives in that, and, and that is uh, the energy that happened. Many people wouldn't acknowledge it. If you went out in the street and asked somebody if they feel tense or um, separate, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. Yeah, because it's looked upon as normal. This is my normal, this is normal, being an individual in a world threatening. So I'm kind of so much used to this tension. Oh, totally. Yeah. And what you also see people doing in the world is trying to soften that tension by gathering in whatever they can, which will give them pleasure. But the, the individual is constantly looking for a better experience yes. because it actually feels unhappy. Oh. Because contracted energy can, can also mean that in my thinking something is always um, coming back, always coming back to the me. So yeah, oh, it's also a, a way no, of me is the most important me. Yeah. It, for you, for the me, me or the self is the most important energy there is, and and it's a fascinating. It's, the me is fascinated by itself. Because it's, it's fascinated by the idea that one day you will find the answer. Mm -hmm. Be that money, sex, power, whatever you like, victimhood, or enlightenment. None of those things are actually available, but the, the main believes they are. Mm. Yeah, yeah, this, the, the attraction is some kind of huge energy. Huge. Yeah, also it's Look at the world we live in, it's, a, it's all about gathering in what I want. Even, even, even uh, uh, so-called spiritual or, or uh, uh, feelings, or this feeling of wanting to help others, for the me, is looked upon as a sort of very worthwhile occupation. But actually, helping others is purely, in the end, self-satisfaction. People do help others because they feel good. It feels good to help. Yeah, yeah. I know. So the whole construct, you know, that, that's presented to the me and the me enjoys is all self-indulgence, entirely self-indulgence. Behind this, it's just the brain which does this. Well, the brain is only a function in the whole. Don't take the brain isn't that important. It's an amazing organism, but it's only an organism that functions in the dualistic story, and all it does is go on helping the me to find, or the apparent me, of course all of it's apparent, uh, to find more, more satisfying experiences. If the me falls away, the brain is not no more interested in having fun. And, uh, well, of course it is. The brain is very yeah. interested in having fun. Exactly. It? Absolutely. Anything to escape from the awfulness of separation 
which is not even usually acknowledged mm-hmm. before you see the world do. It's constantly escaping from um, its own sense of sat- uh, uh, separation from the phone, looking for, you know, what, I wonder if I can find it in there, or in there, or up there, or on there, or on the, on the phone, on the phone more than anything, well, the phone and the computer and, the, and everything else. Um, it's a way of escaping. The me is constantly escaping, or thinks it is anyway. It never works, but it tries hard. <laughs> Because it's understandable, because the past of me is concerned, it is real. It, it, it's a bit in the illusion that I am real, my experience of life is real, the world is real. So it, it's, it's continually working uh, under a complete delusion, a completely deluded um, experience of the world. So if the me collapses, Sorry, if, if, if me collapses, only apparently, it's not if the really apparent me collapses, apparent. in what sort of a dream, is the dream not continuing? No, there's no dream. The dream is only maintained by the me. The me is the dream. The me is so the, dream. The, me, the apparent me is the apparent dream, and it's usually an apparent dream about the story of the world and me in it, when the whole energy of me, which generally or seems to generate that story, collapses. Everything's over. It's the end of any sense of there being anyone, and it's the uh, obviously the end of any sense of there being a real story. There could be an appearance of a story, but it's not real anymore. But there's so still, there's nothing left. There's still an experience of a body. No, no, there's no experience. The end of me is the end of the experiencer, the end of the perceiver, the end of a centre from which life is experienced. All there is, is what happens. All there is left is what is apparently happening. All there is left is what is apparently happening. Nothing else. There isn't anybody it's happening to, it's just what seems to be happening. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's impossible to comprehend. As far as the me is concerned, what we're talking about here doesn't make sense and it's impossible to comprehend. So people usually listen to this and rush quickly back to that which they think they know. I am real and mother and the story is real. <laughs> it was over thus. Of course, that doesn't matter either because everything is what it is. There isn't a better way. There isn't a way.
I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> so I think it's all right. Uh, so, what about the body? The, the body? Yeah. <laughs> Just the body? Yes. Yeah. The body, the wall, the floor. They are, they are just an appearance of no thing. Body. Mm. The body is no thing body. But the problem is the me thinks that the body, that it lives, that it is the body. This is my body. Uh, this is my arm. Because I'm a me, I own things called this arm, my story, the yeah. suffering, everything <coughs> I own, including my body. But you, you can feel a lot more pain in the body than in the wall. No, 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 no. It's not a question of anybody. All the time there's a me, it feels whatever, it experiences whatever it experiences mm -hmm. and takes ownership of it. And there's no me, there's just pain in the body or there's a wall. They're both what is. Okay. That's all there is. It's just what is. There's pain or there isn't pain. There's no longer a differentiation. There's not no longer a something saying, you know, I, I must rush away from this or I must I don't want this. There's no longer something saying, I don't want this. It's just pain. The brain can respond to the pain by taking an aspirin or whatever you like in simple death. Uh, it doesn't need to be for, the, for that, those sort of responses to take place. Mm. Self survival still happens, or survival happens regardless of whether there's a sense of self or not. Because the brain is functioning in the story. The story is there's pain, so I need to do something about it, or the brain needs to do something about it. The body can handle itself. Well, in a, Probably handles this stuff. Yeah. So, but no, nothing has any longer any significance or meaning. Whatever is arising is arising for no one. So it doesn't have a. All the time there's a me. The me thinks it lives in purpose and and has a life that it can influence through its own free will and choice. So when anything happens, it takes on what happens and tries to manipulate it in order to have a better experience. That simply doesn't happen. There's no longer that sense that something is meaningful or has a purpose. Called freedom. But there isn't anybody that has it. So the body is just a thing that is in appearance. Body is nothing appearing as a body. And, and not separate from. There isn't anything that's separate. The, the, the body that appears is the wall that appears, is the wind blowing through the trees that appear. There's one appearance. It's just this one. There's one apparent appearance. Nothing is real. And of course, the ultimate is that nothing's happening at all. There isn't anything happening. Only appears to be. Isn't like this? Uh, everything is real and unreal. Yeah, well, that's another way of putting it. It is and it isn't. But it's real and unreal because it, it is. It is. Everything and nothing are the same, but simultaneously everything else. That's the mystery for the, for the individual.
the insights uh, there was some kind of darkness darkness going on <coughs> I can say what uh, just hands. Oh, no, no. So this is the compassion when, when uh, at the moment there was nothing, just hands, and then I came to the thought, oh, these are my hands. And oh, yeah. I am. So you you claimed your hand. Yeah, it was frightening. So it was happening. just hands. It was frightening. So it's not it, it, the question was. Are these my hands no, or not? not. Or they're not. Huh? They're not anybody's, they're just hands. Yeah. We had um uh, we had a meeting in Ireland some years ago, quite a lot of meetings, when things seemed not to be anybody's, you know. That, that was the that that came up quite a lot in that energy that can arise. As though these things are just what they are without any ownership. And, uh, and then after the meeting, um, some of the Irish people had a beer, so went to a pub and had beer, Guinness. Yes. And one of them the next day said that for a short time, the beer on the table looked as though it wasn't his beer. <laughs> <laughs> and he created, it was the most alarming experience. <laughs> He had, he'd never had, so he came the next day so he wasn't coming anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was too much. I'd rather have my beer than be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> But it is like that. There isn't anything. In, in the end, there's nothing except an appearance, and that appearance is no one's. There isn't anyone. But for the individual, that, that reality seems strange, but that is the natural reality. But everything is only in appearance. How is it that this ownership can can come back? I, mean, I remember when uh, many years ago I looked into the mirror and I couldn't. Yeah. Right, I couldn't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it happened, and it went for a long time like that, and then apparently. <laughs> Mm. The ownership came back. Yeah, the me, well, it's the me, it's the contracted energy comes and seems to come and go. It's all sort of only in appearance, of course, it's not real. But for the individual, it seems as though there's a, um, a movement away and then back and then away and then back sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's for the individual because yeah. also here, sometimes it's like hip hop. Hip -hop yeah, yeah. Dance. It is, yeah. 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 And uh, and energy. What is energy? I feel it's very much like in the body. No. It seems to move. Or in some, when some things are spoken, you, it, it's like the body is dissolving, and the, no. the body is dissolving. Yeah. I mean, the body is the energy. I mean, there isn't anything that isn't energy, as far as my use of that word is concerned. Body, the body, the wall. Uh, Air is energy, nothing in, in the form of energy that's arising or an appearance that's arising. So energy is, is nothing in everything. Mm. Mm. Speaking of energy, what about attention? 
Well, it's the same thing. There isn't anything that isn't nothing. There isn't anything that isn't nothing. And attention, personal, personal attention is nothing appearing to be personal attention. So it's a it's a it's an energy of contracted a contracted sense of energy that arises for the individual who who is can then then seems to experience have the experience of attending to something or having an attention or giving attention to something. And really for me the word attention is like awareness. Awareness is a function that only happens in the story to the me. So the me becomes aware of sitting on a seat. And that, that's what keeps it separate. I am, I am, this is me, I am here, this is, I am real, and I'm sitting on a seat that's real. So I, I, I'm aware of sitting on a seat. This is separation. I, one, is sitting on a seat. Two, one, two, dualism. So it's very close to the definition of dualism. Yeah, it's a, it's a way of keeping up art. Uh, awareness and consciousness are a form of knowing what is happening and are a function of keeping things apart. They are the, the whole support of separation. It has to be two. Oh. Sorry? Attention has to be split. Yeah. For it to even function. Awareness has to be split for it to be a function. There are teachers who somehow um, try and say that awareness is everything, but awareness is a function. For awareness to be, it has to be aware of something. Yeah. So it's two. Hmm? You can come to that and pretend. So it, yeah, yeah, well, there's lots of pretends going on. <laughs> There's a huge um, school of pseudo um, non duality around. It's got nothing to do with non duality. There's a whole school now, a huge movement of people who are claiming to be non dual teachers. There is no such thing as a non dual teaching because non duality is not a thing or a state, it's a term pointing to a mystery that can't be known. So um, it's very difficult to imagine anybody teaching and knowing. But there are a lot of people out there claiming to do just that. And people are listening to it, and because it's pseudo ersatz, because it's based on 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 a, on an, an imagine or a sort of non uh, a, a dream because it's based on the dream it doesn't have any power any sense of liberation in it so people listen to it for a while and uh, sort of become interested in it and then become bored with it pseudo neon non dualism is doing a lot to bore people with the whole idea because it's pseudo it's artificial and illogical. Well, uh, no, dualistic non-dualism is logical because it's uh, uh, teachers of non-dualism are trying to take people along along a path to something that is, uh, doesn't have a path. But they're trying to point to the possibility that there's some sort of promise in the future that people will experience non-dualism. That's Utterly ridiculous. Are they basically saying that, that detachment is um, the detachment's part of the attraction, of, especially in um, in non and in, in self inquiry. A detachment is a very attractive part of that, and it puts people in a position where they are in a state where they think they know or they are aware of everything and therefore detached or apart from it. They can't be affected by it. Mm. It's a very attached, attractive state. The state of awesomeness. Mm.
But there's something about attention. People don't want it so much. No, it's a nice thing, a nice experience to be attentive. Very attractive. When people come to a self-inquiry meeting for the first time, they, they, it's suggested that they sit there and become aware of what is, or so-called aware of what is. So they, they enclose their eyes and they attend to sound, sounds or feelings in the body. So it's a really nice thing to do and gives people a really good experience. But of course it supports their selfhood. And they think they've found something which will give them the answer to life. So they go around for quite a little while, even probably up to five minutes, <laughs> being aware of or attending to what it is. It doesn't matter. It's a story. It's in the story. Could it be that maybe the, the pressure people feel from getting attention? Getting attention or, or giving it is it's just something chemical in the brain. Well, it's a possibility, I don't know enough about that sort of thing, but um, any, any, any process which brings pleasure to people is always attractive and, and uh, awareness is a process. Like meditation or anything like that, it's, it's something that pleasures the me because it makes them feel as though they're doing something worthwhile and, make, and it makes them feel important. So it's possible also that in some way or other that releases endorphins or something, I don't know much about it. What I mean is that if uh, someone is attention star, we won't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then maybe they don't need attention, they just want this. Yeah. This, mm, yeah. Dopamine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, attention is a sort of a, a, a good feeling if you're, somebody is giving you attention that's, that makes you feel the same or important or alive. For a while. But only for a while. Nothing lasts in the story. The story is a series of different events and different experiences.
you uh, you said that this feeling of this is my body, this, this is boundary, <laughs> this is where I am. You said that it's, it's energetic. Well, uh, attractive energy brings the feeling of the center here, which brings the feeling of there being an individual. And the individual usually believes that the body that's in is its body it is, oh, this is who I am, and this is my body. It's an ownership of the body. Because it feels it's in here, and then it, it owns the body that it's in. Invariably, mm -hmm. most people feel uh, that they have a hand, you know, he was saying, this is my hand. <coughs> and of course, that spreads out to all sorts of things, like this is my wife, this is my house, this is my car. Because, because the, 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 um, the individual lives in the story of owning things. This is my suffering. This is my happiness. This is my enlightenment. There are many marked people who, uh, if you go on YouTube, um, I'm sure there are more, but I've seen some people on YouTube where there are five uh, recognized um, teachers or master of whatever you like, or gurus, who actually discuss and, uh, and broadcast their experience of their own enlightenment. It's one of the best, one of my best jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it is unbelievable that people actually believe they become enlightened and describe it to others. It's incredible. <laughs> Usually one of them is better than the other ones or more important. The event of their enlightenment is somehow more prodigious than the other ones. Perhaps he's more humble than the others. Sorry? It, it could be he's more humble than the others. No, um, uh, his humility is very great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's colossal and very powerful. Um, humility. <laughs> humility is like that. What me does. Me is fascinated by the idea of success. The ultimate success, I suppose you could say, is, is, is personal enlightenment. The only problem with that is that there is no such thing. 